welcome to another zesty performance, shall we say, by Corona Chemistry. Giving you the information you need to tackle general equilibrium. The prerequisite for all things equilibrium as you start to pursue acids, bases, uh, gases, solubility, all that jazz. In fact, this is the term we've been utilizing for the past several videos and several different instances saying that this moment was coming, that we were going to learn about equilibrium. And here it is. What a momentous occasion for you. This is one of those to go home to mom and dad and say, Mama, I made it. Daddy, are you proud? Yes, son. I am. Let's get into it. As always, you can find the links to the notes and the slides on the screen in front of you, just below in the description of this video. You're welcome. Seriously, not e not a dime. Not a dime. It's there for you. Complimentary. <laughs> just like a breakfast at the Holiday Inn. And this is the big truth bomb of this unit. That most chemical processes that we have been analyzing for years now are actually reversible. That's right, Miss Mills in second grade when she was initially teaching you about science and the world in general. And she said that physical changes were always reversible and chemical changes are not reversible. The lie detector test determined that that was a lie. That most chemical processes are in fact reversible. And in fact, it is a constant dance between both sides, the reactants producing products, the products creating reactants, until we reach the sweet spot, equilibrium. And the very, very common misconception is that once we hit equilibrium, that the reaction is done, that there's no forward, no backwards, that everything is just stuck. But in fact... It is the forward and reverse reactions happening at the exact same rates as one another. It's a very, very easy thing to mess up. And I've heard a lot of things get wrong even when they're teaching it. Um, but this uses a mathematical expression that should be very, very familiar to us. Why? Because the last couple Corona Chemistry videos have hinted at this. Not even mentioning what your teachers have been doing in class. This is pretty familiar. So we've got this hypothetical equation down here at the bottom of our screen. AA plus BB makes CC and DD. And notice what we're doing. It's products over reactants. Products over reactants. But the weird thing here is that our coefficients become our exponents. You are raised to the power of the coefficient. Very, very interesting. Shake some things up mathematically. Let's see what we're going to do with it. And so this has a whole bunch of applications. We're going to keep it pretty simple here today. We're going to reference uh, a few things. But acids and bases are going to get their own dedicated space for equilibrium. Gases are going to get their own dedicated space. Solubility is going to get its own dedicated space. Uh, so today we're pretty much going to keep it simple with the concentrations of reactions going forward and backwards. And so just to point out an example that you could do this with, if you'll recall, there are strong acids, there are weak acids. No, so clo clo for those who know what's up. Those are the seven strong acids, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, so on and so forth. Well, anything outside of that list of seven does not completely dissociate. Yes, the acid will break apart into its pieces, its ionic components, but not all of them. In fact, usually it's less than 5% that do so. And so this concept of equilibrium could be applied to the dissociation of weak acids where the products would be the ions formed from when the acid breaks apart, and the reactants, of course, are the acid itself. Notice we get a little different subscript denotation for that letter K. K is for equilibrium. You can have a KA, a KB, a KP, a KSP, all that jazz, and you're going to get to know them so, so, so well, right? Another thing to point out here is we do not include solids or pure liquids and the only pure liquid that i could ever think of being involved here would be h2o water in these expressions why because their concentrations are not affected solids whenever they are staying solids in solution means that they are not soluble which means the ions aren't going to be breaking apart and therefore not reacting so the solids concentrations aren't going to change and then water of course is not involved chemically either 
in the vast majority of these processes. Therefore, it is not going to be included in the products overreactance relationship that you see before you. And a very important concept. I don't know why this is one of my favorites when I was in school. Le Chatelier's principle. Maybe it was because you sound so fancy when you say it. But it effectively states that uh, a reaction at equilibrium is at a delicate state. And of course, a reaction at equilibrium is assuming that a whole bunch of these other variables are remaining constant. Well, that's difficult to achieve in the real world. And so Le Chatelier says that a variety of pushes or prompts could cause this delicate balance to shift. And so what we are going to assess here now is what are these changes and what are these provocations going to do to the reaction? Is it going to cause it to shift left, meaning towards the beginning, or shift right, meaning towards the end, the products? As we've learned with spontaneity and all that, we know that certain reactions favor the right versus the left. Uh, whether they favor the products or the reactants, right? It depends on what you are looking at. But Le Chalier, we are looking at the pushes that can cause it to go either direction. And what's also really, really cool about this concept is that these are some of the most intuitive questions uh, when it comes to the AP test. I love seeing Le Chalier questions on there because they're very, very, very logical to assess. So let's get into the few variables we can look at. The first of which, and the main one we are going to be assessing today, is concentration. If you jack up the concentration of either the reactant side or the product side, it is going to cause a shift in the direction of the opposite of what you have just added. So we've got a reaction here with sodium, let's say solid sodium, uh, chlorine gas here, making NaCl. And this is perhaps a weird thing to do here because we did also just mention about, you know, solids that aren't changing their concentration, all that jazz. But let's use it for the example, shall we? If I am to add more sodium to the system, then that means the reaction goes, ha ha, I can make more NaCl now. I've got the ingredients necessary to do so. And so it causes it to go towards the products. Likewise, if I add more salt to the system, more NaCl to the system, then the reaction goes, ha ha, I can make more reactants. And so therefore it causes it to go to the left. So effectively, whichever way you tip the scales, it's going to go back the opposite way. I feel like that's pretty logical, pretty logical. We know that when a system achieves equilibrium, that there is some numerical amount of everything involved in the reaction, meaning that if I add more reactants, I will, of course, have at least some of the other reactant necessary or more than one reactant necessary to make some of that product. And, of course, the, the same goes for if there's more than one product associated in whatever chemical reaction you are looking at. But pretty logical, right? If you increase the concentration on one side, it will cause it to shift the opposite direction. Then we get into pressure. I feel like this one is also pretty logical, uh, especially considering things that we've discussed in previous videos, if you've really been watching them. If we increase the pressure on a container, meaning I push it from the outside, I force these molecules closer together. Well, the system has a panic reaction and it goes, oh my gosh, we've got a lot of molecules in here and they're getting closer and closer together. We need to shift in a direction that results in less molecules slamming against each other. Because, you know, we don't want this container to burst and set us free. We want to stay safe inside this locked room. And so, if you increase the pressure, it causes us to shift in the direction of less moles of gas. In this reaction we have here in front of us, we've got one mole of N2 and three moles of H2 makes two moles of NH3. There are two moles of product, four moles of reactant. If I increase the pressure, it is going to shift towards the product side because there is less gas over here. Likewise, if I reduce the pressure, allowing the gas molecules to spread out more, then the reaction goes, oh my gosh, we've got all this land. Might as well take advantage of it. Let's go run for miles and let's make as many molecules so that we can have them enjoy this bounty of land given to us, bestowed upon us by the chemistry gods above. <laughs> that's the celebratory chant of the chemistry gods if you're not familiar and so if you decrease the pressure on a system well then that is going to cause the system to shift towards the more 
gas side, the heavier mole concentration amount of gas. That's a lot of words just to say that we're going to take advantage of this great amount of space. But I did put a strange scenario down here at the bottom. What if you were to add a new non-reactive gas to the system? Usually, whenever they mention something like this, it's some noble gas, right? Inert gas. Well, they have to give you, for this to really shake things up, they have to give you more details. Because what we are effectively uh, assessing in the situation is, is, is the partial pressure of these gases going to change? Because that, that is what is causing this Le Chatelier change in the first place, is the need to change our partial pressures. Because every gas in the system has a pressure. But have you assessed the system itself yet? What kind of container are you in? Are you in a balloon? Or are you in a very thick metal box that cannot change its volume, its amount of space? Because if I add helium to a, a system, that doesn't actually change the pressure of any other gas. Yes, that adds pressure to the internal system, but it doesn't change the behavior of any of the other gas molecules. And that's a very, very big uh, misconception a lot of people have, is that this gas that you've added to the system is going to change things. However, things do have to change if they add the details such as this system maintains constant pressure. Well, if it maintains constant pressure and you've added a gas to it, well, then that means that the gases that were already in there, their pressure has to decrease, which means that you have to shift towards the side with less gas. In this example, that would be shifting towards the products. But if they don't give you any details like that, then assume that we don't have to maintain constant pressure and no nothing. And that means this non-reactive gas isn't going to dictate any of the behavior of what's already in there, which means this will cause no change. Sometimes the answer to these Le Chatelier scenarios is that there is no change to the system. And that's pretty cool. I like when there's no change uh, as my answer. One, it causes us to think. And also, when I don't have to do work, I like that. That's cool. Temperature. Well, for, to assess temperature and how that's going to impact a scenario, you need to know whether a reaction is endothermic or exothermic. And, of course, an exothermic reaction generates heat, an endothermic reaction uh, absorbs heat. It needs heat to progress. And so if you add heat to an environment, that is going to shift the reaction in a direction away from where the heat is. For an exothermic reaction, that's on the product side. For an endothermic reaction, that is the reactant side. So if I've got a reaction that wants to go boom and generate a lot of heat, but I already make it hot, hot, hot in there, well, then the reaction kind of has a brain switch go off and go, why do we need to do anything? It's already hot, hot, hot in here. In fact, weren't we hired to make it hot? What do they need us for? It's already hot. So let's just stay put, shall we? So if I raise the temperature in a reaction that is meant to be exothermic, that is going to cause it to shift towards the reactants, shift towards the side that is away from the heat because it feels like it doesn't need to generate any more heat, almost like it is an intuitive, thoughtful creature. Conversely, for an endothermic reaction, something that needs heat to get going, if I elevate the temperature, well, then the reaction goes, oh my gosh, you got all the fuel we need? Let's go! Press the green light! and progress towards the product side. I feel like that's pretty logical as well. Pretty logical. But you need to know what the sign of the reaction is. Is it a negative delta H or a positive delta H? And that's something we've talked about uh, in pretty great lengths of detail uh, in these last few videos. Dilution, this is a weird one. Uh, and it will get, this will be in conversations in the later video when you're talking about solution equilibrium. Um, but, when we're looking at double replacement reactions, this is typically what you're looking at here. In a double replacement reaction, you have aqueous reactant, aqueous reactant, mix, aqueous product, and insoluble product. Remember, the goal of a double replacement reaction is to make a precipitate, a gas, or water. And the vast majority of those being water or that precipitate. And those are included in your equilibrium expression. And so... If you add water to this solution, that is going to spread out the molecules that are dissolved in solution. And it is going to say, hey, we've got more space. That means we can put more ions in here. So if you water something down, 
that is going to allow you to create more aqueous species, aka put more ions in here. Conversely, if water was to be lost by evaporation or intentionally removing it, whatever it is, well, then that means you can't have as many ions and you're going to shift towards the side with less ions. And we will see this concept come up in one of our example questions here pretty shortly. This is a faster video than normal for us because this really is the precursor to a lot of equilibrium discussions. Uh, we've actually already mentioned this as well. Th this is a good deal of review uh, simply because it is inherently applied to the units that we've talked about before this one. K is equilibrium. K is the value when a reaction has reached equilibrium. But of course, a reaction doesn't start there. A reaction has to get there. And at every stage of the game, we can calculate where it currently is, and that's Q. Q is where you are, whereas K is the destination. And so, very logical here. If your Q is smaller than your K, meaning I am... Q is less than K, and if you think about what the expression is, products over reactants, that means your number needs to get bigger which means I need more products to make that happen because bigger number on top over smaller number on bottom makes number bigger. That's caveman speak for how to make numbers larger. That means it is going to shift right towards the products. And of course, if your Q is larger than your K, meaning you've got too large a number in the numerator, you need to create more reactants. You need to shift left in order to reach that value of k that you're going for i always mix up the k's and q's i i haven't thought of a way to to memorize that but like even like i've done it for years and i still found myself almost saying q at the end of that for equilibrium oh gosh i think it's because of the q in equilibrium that i want to say q maybe i need to start spelling equilibrium with a k maybe merriam webster needs to get on that have i just changed the game for everyone and so as a reaction is progressing well we need to assess some changes and primarily we're going to be looking at concentrations today this has a variety of applications as we've already said time and time again we're going to utilize something called a rice table or some call it the ice table online it's the same thing and that stands for reaction where you are starting how we are changing, and where we are ending, the equilibrium concentration. And this is where the math comes into play. And in all honesty, it's pretty simple math. Uh, and, and I understand that you're following along on a video right now. Basically, I'm just going to show you the work that I'm doing, and you can plug and chug and mirror it, uh, and it can't steer you wrong. And so, hold on, let me let me get a little alter, alteration here. Get that away from the equation. We've got a mixture of 5 moles of H2 and 10 moles of I2 are placed in a 5 liter container at 450 degrees Celsius and allowed to come to equilibrium. At equilibrium, the concentration of hydroiodic acid is 1.87 moles per liter. Calculate the value for K for this reaction under these conditions. So we know that there is going to be some value of product produced at the end. And there's still going to be some reactants left over. It's not going to be the entirety of H2 and I2 used up in order to make this. And also notice the terminology utilized in these tables. It is concentration, not moles. So they give us the value in moles. They also give us the volume, which is going to allow us to very capably, very easily go from moles to molarity, concentration. So you'll see I've already done that in the table. 5 over 5 is the 1. 10 over 5 is the 2, and that is our initial concentration of reactants. And of course, in the beginning, we have only started with reactants. We don't have any product, which is why it is at zero. We have none. But based on stoichiometry and the coefficients of this reaction, we know that as time proceeds, I am going to gradually lose H2, lose I2, and gain HI. But because of stoich, I'm going to gain HI at twice the rate as I am going to lose H2 and I2. That is the thinking behind me losing a variable of X from both my H2 and I2 and gaining 2X for my HI. 
And so algebraically, then at the end, we use the information also provided to us that the equilibrium concentration for HI is 1.87. So that 2X, the 2X that I gain from HI makes 1.87, which means the X is 0 0.935, 1.87 divided by 2. And if this times 2 is what HI resulted in, well then H2 and I2 had to lose that same X, which means I can subtract 0.935 from both of these starting values in order to get the final equilibrium concentrations of what we are working with, and we can solve for K, which is simply products over reactants, the concentrations of products over reactants. And notice here this 2, it is the superscript, the exponent. Why? Where did it come from? That is the coefficient of 2HI here. Your coefficient becomes the power you are elevated to. And so we get a large K value here, a large value greater than one, which means this is a reaction that heavily favors the products, heavily favors the products because the numbers at the end, my product end up, uh, the numerator ended up being larger than the denominator, which means we are heavily favoring the product side of this reaction. Ta-da! And that's as basic as it gets, right? Uh, and the cool thing is about the actual AP test is they're not going to hit you with all the curveballs that we're about to hit you with. Uh, but we'll get you good and ready for anything that might happen. If K is smaller than 0 0.001, generally you can ignore the change that is going to occur in the reactants, right? We saw this uh, in the last example. We saw the 1.0 minus X, the 2.0 minus X. What we're saying here is if the K is so small, we can actually generally ignore these X's down here. And the reason why is this. The number is so small because the reaction is favoring the reactant so heavily. Because what you have here is you have a value of products over a value of reactants, and it resulted in a number that is less than 0 0.001. What does that mean? You've got a very, very small numerator and a very large denominator, and that's at equilibrium. That means the reaction is at its happy point. So the reaction loves the reactant side, and it doesn't really like the product side. And so generally, in, in most examples you can actually ignore this X. In this example, I'm going to show you that it's still just simple algebra, right? Those of us that haven't maybe gone all the way through algebra two, this might seem a little wacky to us and it might seem a little fuzzy, um, but it is just solving for X. Uh, and this is one where you could eliminate that X on the denominator, but I'm going to show you how to solve for it uh, regardless. So we have a general reaction with a K value of 2.8 times 10 to the negative seven, incredibly small. This reaction loves the reactants. Whatever A, B, whatever they are, it likes those over the 2C. Easy peasy. You are given 4 molar of substance A, 4 molar of substance B. Set up the equilibrium expression and find the equilibrium concentrations for each substance. And so the rice table is set up exactly like last time. And like I said, because our K value is so small, we could actually just eliminate this minus X in both of these down here. We still want to account for the X in the C because we want to know what non-zero amount of product we have, but we could effectively eliminate it, which means we're going to essentially end with four molar of both A and B in the end anyway. But let's show you the math. We've got the expression set up exactly like the last one because it does have the same coefficient set up. Um, we've got that C squared on top over A times B because they both have coefficients of one. But then we've got, we're plugging in all the numbers. They give us the K value. We have a, our rice table gives us where the X's are and this 2X, all that jazz. And notice that everything on the right side of the equation is all squared. So just solving for X, we could just square root both sides. Then you get whatever 2.8 times 10 to the negative 7 square root it is, is 5.29 times 10 to the negative 4 equals 2X over 4 minus X. And then, of course, it's just solving for x. I multiply both sides by the denominator. What you do to one side, you have to do to the other. And so then you get 2.12 times 10 to the negative third minus a very juicy decimal, 0.000529x, is equal to that 2x that is left behind on the numerator. Bring our x's over, join the like terms with one another, and solve for x. And we get that the change is 0 0.00106. Not much of a change at all. And so even if we were to round this to the sig figs given to us in the problem, which was 
effectively one sig fig with this four molar i know it's kind of a sloppy question to give you that means this rounded would just the concentration would be the same at the beginning as it is at the end that's what we're looking at here granted they probably would give you a better sig fig so you could round this to like 3.99 or even 3.999 right uh, for both of these values but either way you do get a non-zero amount for the product that you were looking for this is the real question here is how much product are we producing and it's still not much right but still it's something it's something and so that's the algebra behind these rice tables there's really not that much to it however there are situations where you can't square root both sides and we're here to show you one of those as well where you have to utilize the quadratic formula negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a seventh grade miss rice wow i just realized that so conveniently lines up my seventh grade honors math teacher's name was miss rice and here we are using the song she taught me to teach rice tables i hated that woman The only time I ever got in trouble in middle school was for when she said I stole a pencil that I found under my desk and when another teacher came into the classroom looking for it, described it, I immediately plucked that bad boy out of my pencil pouch and I could have kept my mouth shut. It was a sleek pencil. It was a Mercedes Benz of pencils. It was good. But I didn't. Honest boy Corona Chemistry spoke up and said, is this the pencil to which you were referring to? immediately coughed it up and later i'm tried by jury under the charge of theft of a pencil and put into iss locked away just fighting my inner demons for a full school day curse you miss rice curse you but also thank you for giving me that song. Anyways, let's move on. A flask contains 1.66 atmospheres of nitrogen dioxide initially. At some temperature, the equilibrium constant K is 0.125. Calculate the equilibrium partial pressure of the two gases. Very simple chemical reaction. 2NO2 makes N2O4. Not bad. And so we're going to do a rice table. la da 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 Based on the coefficients, we get the 1.66 minus 2x is the resultant NO2. And, of course, the plus x because it just has a coefficient of 1 for N2O4. But we can't square root both sides because x is just x on the top. Well, that don't work, which means I have to do a little foil action. First outside, inside, last. I heard that the math world has changed that to the butterfly method, whatever the heck that is, right? we should know how to factor boys and girls we should know how to foil okay i don't need a lackluster insect to teach me this and so we foil the 1.66 minus 2x and get these values here not the prettiest which is why of course you can't just factor it with your brain unless you are some sort of mathematical genius that i am nowhere near uh and we get 0.5x squared minus 1.83x plus 0.344 at the very end once again, cannot do that in my head. Which is why, let your calculator do the work. There are even programs you can put into your calculator that will do the quadratic formula for you. If not, sing the song. Negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. And you'll get two values because, of course, we are effectively we're square rooting stuff. Well, one of these values is going to be ludicrous. I got 0.199 and 3.46 for this. When I initially started with a pressure of 1.66, how the heck could you get a value of 3.46 when you can't even lose that much? That doesn't make sense. So, of course, the smaller number is the number. And, of course, if you're ever in a value where it's a negative value, you can't have a negative amount of moles of stuff. So get rid of those negative values. It's got to be a positive answer. And of course, it's going to be the smaller answer. Typically, the smaller answer. I can't think of any scenario where it'd be the larger answer. But like this is logical. I can't lose more than I had in the beginning. 
black holes would open up everywhere. And so then, of course, we apply that X to our situation. NO2 is going to lose two times that value of X, which is why it is 1.26. And N2O4 is just going to gain that value of X, uh, period, which is 0.199 ATM. Pretty simple here. And that is the application of the quadratic formula in this situation. And so a lot of the times what a question might have you do is give you the values at a current point. They'll give you K and then they'll give you the values at a current point. And you need to determine whether or not the reaction is going to go to the right or go to the left. And that is all contingent upon how your Q is positioned. Use that logic. If your Q needs to get smaller, then you need to go back from where you came from, back to where you came from. You need to go to the reactants to make your value smaller. If your number needs to get larger, then you need to make more products. And so that is going to dictate whether you are losing X on the reactant side or gaining X on the product side uh, in your rice table. And so there are some cool scenarios and questions you can do with that. Um, I like those. I don't think I've ever seen those on an AP test. When I was looking through these, these practice books I have and looking online, I didn't see any official AP questions with it. But of course, in class, you might have to do that where you need to assess the current positioning of a reaction. Is it going right or is it going left? If it's going right, the plus X will be on the product side. If it's going left, then the plus X will be on the reactant side. You have to consider that kind of thing. But of course, let's get into our sample question, shall we? Like I said, pretty quick video. Pretty quick video. The following reaction is found to be at equilibrium at 25 degrees Celsius. We got 2SO3 makes O2 and 2SO2. Which of the following would cause the reverse reaction to speed speed up? Weird. What a weird typo. Would cause the reverse reaction to speed up. So, of course, the reverse reaction is going from the right to the left, meaning I'm going to increase the amount of SO3. Notice also that this is an exothermic reaction based on the delta H that they gave us. It is releasing energy. That could play a factor in how we answer these questions. So we want to make more SO3. Let's go through the options. Adding more sulfur trioxide. Adding more SO3. So if I put more SO3 in here, is the reaction going to want to make more SO3? No. This is the exact opposite of how we started Le Chatelier's principle, where if we add components to one side of the reaction, it is going to shift away from it. So that would cause the forward reaction to speed up so a is no bueno raising the pressure squeezing the molecules together squeezing them elevating the pressure well that causes the reaction to panic the system to panic and say oh my gosh we're getting forced together it's like star wars episode four when they get thrown into the 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 trash compactor with the weird worm monster underwater goodness gracious what a time I'd love to be in a galaxy far, far away. Well, the system wants to not be crushed. And so it shifts towards the side with less gas molecules on it. This side's got two. This side's got three. Guess what? That would make your reaction want to make more SO3. That's pretty good. But let's look at the rest of this. Lowering the temperature. If I make it chilly in here, how is this reaction going to respond? This reaction is exothermic. It releases heat, meaning if I make it colder in whatever room this is currently happening in, the reaction goes, hey, boys, this is what we're here for. This is why I joined the force. We're here to make it hot. That is going to speed the reaction up because this is an exothermic reaction. It wants to make things hot, so making it colder gives them a challenge that they want to take on removing some sulfur dioxide we didn't explicitly mention it but i do think it's it's logical right we said that if we added more of one side that that's going to cause it to shift away well, the same thing goes for if we remove one side if we remove components from one side that's going to make the reaction want to go towards the side that we now have a deficit in so if i take some of this so2 away that's going to make the reaction want to make more so2 meaning make the forward reaction speed up so the only logical answer here is B. B, 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 B. See why I love Le Chatelier questions? You just tackle them with logic. Which of the following cause a reduction in the value for the equilibrium constant? This is different terminology 
Same kind of question. Which would make the equilibrium number decrease? We're talking about K. Which would make your K smaller? This means, how do I make more reactants and less products? Because if I need to make K smaller, that means I've got a smaller number on top and a bigger number on bottom, which means I need to make more SO3. So it's the same question. Number one and number two, different words, same exact question. And A is the same answer choice. These are official AP questions, by the way. Uh, this is from the same section of a multiple choice section I found. Back-to-back -back questions, too. Answer choice A is the same thing. They're the same question. Answer choice A is the same. Uh, so I need to make more SO3. Do I do that by adding more SO3? No, I do not. B, reducing the amount of O2. That's the same thing as answer choice D in question one. If I reduce the amount of O2, that's going to make the reaction want to go forward. That's not good. If I raise the temperature or D, lower the temperature. First, test taking strategy, numero uno. If you've got two answer choices that are exact opposites of one another, it's probably going to be one of those, right? That's just logic. Can't put exact opposites of, e of one another. It's very rare for it to not to be the answer choice, right? So it's got to be C or D. Plus, we've already ruled out A and P. But this is an exothermic reaction. It wants to make things hot. If it's already hot up in her, then what does the reaction, why does it need to do what it does? It doesn't. So it says, why did they invite us if it was already hot? Let's just go back to where we came from, SO3. Let's do that, shall we? So the answer is C, raising the temperature. If we elevate the temperature, the reaction does not need to move forward to release the heat that it was going for in the first place. The answer is C. At 150 degrees Celsius, the equilibrium constant Kc for the reaction has a value of 300. That's a big number. This reaction was allowed to reach equilibrium in a sealed container and the partial pressure due to IBR was found to be 3 atm. Which of the following could be the partial pressures of Br2 and I2? This is solved for the exact same way as all the other K values are. This is Kp, the equilibrium constant of the pressures of the gas is what you're looking at here. It is still products over reactants the exact same way. And I feel like this, especially with these set of options, you can mathematically prove this, of course, but this is kind of a no-brainer to me. Products over reactants. Notice our product is uh, has a coefficient of 2 which means the numerator is going to be squared, whatever that value is, and then our reactants both have coefficients of one, so there's nothing to be done there that's fancy. But it's always products over reactants, which means I've got three squared, nine, over two mystery pressures down below, and I need to make the number huge, which means I need to have very, very small amounts of reactants here. And if I look at answer choices C and D, like one of these even has a pressure that matches what our product is like that there's no way that this could ever be and you can mathematically prove it it'd be nine over three well that doesn't equal 300 that equals three so it's not going to be these larger numbers and so my brain would gravitate towards the smallest values here 0.1 and 0.3 so it would be your products which of course is three squared over your 0.1 times your 0.3 and that's going to give you the largest values here uh, to get your large value of 300. I feel like that one is, is pretty logical as well. And so I, I, I like to include these questions that, you know, make it kind of easy for you, right? Or sometimes apply the, you know, concepts in previous videos, all that jazz. Next, and we hit our free response. N2 plus 3H2 makes ammonia, 2NH3. And of course, this is an exothermic reaction, negative 92.4 kilojoules. When the reaction above took place at a temperature of 570 Kelvin, very hot, the following equilibrium concentrations were measured. Write the equilibrium expression and calculate its value. They give you straight up all the numbers. These are official AP section questions, and they're straight up giving you all of the values. Like, there's not much here. It's products over reactants. Make sure you raise it to the power of its coefficient. Bim, bam, boom, calculate it. And I'll show you that number on the next screen. Then, calculate delta G. Well, we did this last unit. Rat link, baby. 
We'll show you that on the next screen. But of course you need K. That's the link. Link. In rat link. So we need the K from part A to solve for that. So let's go ahead into the next uh, slide and show you those. Products over reactants. They give us the product is 0 0.20. We square that because of the 2 in front of it. Divided by our two reactants. And one of our reactants is cubed to the third power because it has a coefficient of 3. And if you plug that in your calculator correctly, you get a number of 10. And then to calculate for delta G, applying it previous units material, that is minus RT natural log K. R is that constant 8.31 joules. Our temperature is 570 Kelvin. They've already given it to you in Kelvin. And then you plug in the K that you just solved for. And you get about negative one, a negative 11,000 joules. Of course, our sig figs are two because of our temperature, 570. And all of our measurements are two sig figs as well. Like, what a throwback. And it's just, it's easy. Plug and chug. I like that. And then we get some Le Chalier questions. Tie that in for some free AP points, shall we? Describe how the concentration of H2 at equilibrium will be affected by each of the following changes to the system at equilibrium. That's a lot of equilibriums in one sentence. The temperature is increased. We've seen this scenario time and time again. Twice in the two multiple choice questions that we did, the first two. This is an exothermic reaction. If I increase the temperature, does that make the reaction want to proceed? No. Because the reaction thinks its purpose is to release energy. So if the energy is already there, then what the heck does it need to react for? Which means it would go towards the reactants. So the question is how the concentration of H2 is affected. This would cause the H2's concentration to increase because the reaction is going to shift left in this scenario. The volume of the reaction chamber is increased. We talked about this as well. If we get more space, more space to roam, then the reaction goes, let's get all the people in here. Let's get as many people able to take advantage of this as possible. Let's shift to where there's more gas. There's four moles of gas on the left. There's two moles of gas on the right. It is going to shift towards the left, which means the concentration of H2 would increase in this scenario. It would shift left. N2 gas is added to the reaction chamber. Notice that N2 is on the same side as H2. If I increase how much N2 is available, then that is going to shift towards the products, which means the concentration of H2 is going to decrease here. It's going to shift right in this process. And then we get this weird scenario that we posed to you earlier in the video. Helium gas is added to the reaction chamber. It doesn't give you any details about this chamber. Nothing. Doesn't tell you if it's a balloon or some steel box. Doesn't tell you anything. So don't go assuming things. You know what assuming does? It makes us something out of you and me. Right? This is a kid-friendly program. Okay? Helium is nowhere to be found in the reaction. The pressure of helium does not dictate the pressures of these other gases. So without them giving us information on what this container is made of, right? If think about what could this what, what, what could happen here. If the container must be held at a constant pressure, then helium's pressure would cause the other gases' pressure to decrease, right? That's something you could talk about. If this is a balloon, then helium's molecules in there would cause the balloon to expand, which may cause the pressure to decrease of everything. But that's not what it's saying here. It's simply saying, does helium have any impact on the behavior of hydrogen gas here? And the answer is no. There would be no change of H2 at equilibrium in this scenario. Don't overthink and don't assume things. That's where they try to get you. Don't let them get you. No, no, no. And a very conceptual free response. I wanted to keep it pretty conceptual here because we did three different mathematical examples here. Uh, and they usually keep it pretty light in these free response sections. Um, so I think concepts are, are better to emphasize here. Especially because half the mathematical examples we do would just overlap with the other equilibrium scenarios we're going to pose in the next couple of units with acids, bases, uh, solution, equilibrium, all that jazz. So for sodium chloride, the solution process with water is endothermic, meaning it gets cold, cold, cold. It takes energy to break apart any cell. Makes sense, right?
right? Ionic compound, it wants to stay together. Describe the change in entropy. So a little throwback to last unit. Well, of course, it's going from NaCl to Na plus and Cl minus. It's going from one piece to two pieces. Two pieces is more disordered than one piece. So the entropy is going to increase whenever this dissociates. Simple. Two saturated aqueous NaCl solutions, one at 20 degrees Celsius, one at 50 degrees Celsius are compared. Which one will have the higher concentration? Uh, there's actually a couple things you can think about here. If you'll recall from your first uh, round with chemistry, your, your honors chemistry class, your sophomore chem chemistry class, whatever it is, you talk about solubility. And you might remember those weird charts that had all the lines on them. It kind of looked like a spider web. Generally, as you increase the temperature of something, you can dissolve more things. And this is how they make rock candy. They make water hot. They pour a crap ton of sugar in there. They put the stick in. Then they let the temperature drop back down, which means it can't keep as much sugar dissolved. And so the sugar crystallizes. It creates a super saturated solution. Um, so that's one thing you could think about. But let's apply what we learned today to it. This is an endothermic process. If I have more energy present in this scenario and endothermic processes need energy to get going, then it is going to use that excess energy to drive the reaction. So 50 degrees Celsius is going to allow you to dissolve more NaCl than 20 degrees Celsius. That's what you're looking at here. So 50 degrees will have the higher concentration. And you can justify that a couple different ways. Which way will the solubility reaction shift if the temperature is increased? Well, by golly, if I didn't already answer this question three seconds ago, right? It, it, B and C are the same thing. How cool is that? This is a real question. B and C are the same thing. I guess it, it sucks if you really get it wrong because then you have to double down and get it double wrong. Um, but you're heating things up. That means the water molecules have more kinetic energy to dislodge these uh, sodium chloride particles. That's the, the basis of solubility. But you can also talk about the fact that this is an endothermic process. More heat allows us to drive the reaction. Bam, bam, boom. If a saturated solution of NaCl is left out overnight and some of the solution evaporates, how will that affect the amount of solid NaCl present? Kind of already answered this with the rock candy scenario as well, didn't I? Water evaporates. And we also talk about this in Le Chalier's as well. Um, this is more in line with solution equilibrium, which I think is the next video that we are going to do. Um, if you dilute a solution, you add more water to it, that gives you more space, which gives you more opportunity to create ions, which means a greater rate of solution, dissolution, I should say. This makes sense, right? More water, I can dissolve more things, right? You can't dump the entire Kool-Aid powder container into a little cup of water. You need a large pitcher to do so, right? That's what we're looking at here. So if water evaporates, that means there's less water there to create ions, to foster that ion production, which means it's going to shift in the direction that has less ions, which means we're going to go back to solid NaCl. So this is going to increase the amount of solid NaCl present because there's not as much water there to dissolve things. That is the explanation. And this is a faster video than normal. That's general equilibrium, which is the appetizer to all of the different scenarios to how equilibrium is going to be applied. As always, this is Corona Chemistry, here for all of your at-home chemistry needs. I love you.